Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. We are at 8.30, so we're going to go ahead and get the meeting started here. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Brian and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Welcome home. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street in Doylestown, PA. The food and the fellowship for this group starts at 8 o'clock and the speaker comes on at 8.30. The business meeting for this group meets here every Saturday, 7 p.m. to 7.30. Please feel free to show up early and join us. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others can benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone that is new or is that visiting from out of town that would like to introduce themselves on a first name basis so we can welcome you? Yeah. Hey, my name's Ted. I'm visiting from Boston. Hey, right. welcome. Welcome. Uh, all again. Okay. <laughs> welcome. That's it? Okay. Uh, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with a working knowledge of the 12 steps and who is willing to sponsor, please raise your hands. So there you go. If you are new, if you're out there, you're new, you're struggling, grab one of those people after the meeting. We'd love to help you get into the solution a little. Uh, are there any announcements from the floor for the good of AA? Yeah, yeah. Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa. Yes. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. Andy. Andy. Very cool. Thank you, Andy. And the flyer for that will be posted on the Facebook page for this group, Conscious Contact Group. Um, this group has a sister group, which is a big book study meeting. It meets every Thursday at 730 right up the road here at Salem UCC Church. That is 186 East Court Street in Doylestown, PA, and the coffee is on at 615. So again, feel free to show up early and join us. Uh, we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who can't afford them can put their donations in the jar on that back table there marked Big Book and CD Donations. All CDs are available free of charge. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, PA. Uh, we post the speakers from this group here. We also post speakers from a Monday night meeting that we have in the room right next to here, 6 p.m. on Mondays. It's a step discussion group. Uh, as I said, this group also has a Facebook page. It's a good resource to have to stay tied in with happenings for this group. It's also events, celebrations, anniversaries that other groups have in the area. So good resource to have. Um, you can find our speakers there. Uh, join our Facebook page. Yeah, we got that. Uh, with that, Steve's going to come up here. He's going to read our, our uh, Just for Today prayer. Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve. I'm an alcoholic. This is the Just for Today prayer of recovery. Just for today, I will be agreeable. I will look as well as I can, dress becomingly, talk low, act courteous, criticize not one bit, not find fault with anything, and not try to improve or regulate anybody except myself. And next we have the amazing and positive Sarah. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Sarah, Hi, Sarah. alcoholic, the AA preamble. Okay. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. 
AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and hope other alcoholics to achieve sorority. And now we will welcome Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Teresa, I'm an alcoholic. The AA 12 Steps of Recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brian's going to come back up. Okay, uh, we have a seventh tradition. Uh, there's no dues or fees for AA membership. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Um, their contributions help us to cover the cost of rent, food, big book workshops, things of that nature. Uh, there's absolutely no smoking on the church prop property. This is the church's policy, not ours. We're very privileged to be able to use this beautiful facility to have our meeting in every week. And if you could just be considerate of that as you're coming and going, don't, you know, take it across the street. Don't leave cigarette butts on the premises. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. And now to introduce our speaker for tonight, a good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group on loan to us from the Primary Purpose Group of Austin, Texas. Please help me welcome Rory. I'm Rory McShane, I'm alcoholic. Give me a second to get situated here. Y'all don't start working right when you get to work, do you? You know, you gotta get situated. Man, I love this group. This group knows how to welcome a speaker, man, especially a fat speaker. You guys got the donuts, the you know, the whole thing. I was a beautiful room. I was speaking down in um I was speaking down in York last night and, and it's like on this tiny little stage and the lights are like this far from me and I got sweat pouring down my face. So like I guarantee you someone who was in the audience like there's no way this guy's really sober. He's on one right now, like, you know. Um, I'm sober since June the 5th of 2010. Um, and for that, I owe you all my life, and I try to never forget that. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't use notes when I, when I talk in AA. I, I did for a little bit, and I, and I have kind of decided that uh, my job is to, you know, I went back in the back, and I, and I said a seven-step prayer and a third-step prayer, and my job is to come up here and be as honest and vulnerable as I, as I can be in the hopes that someone here will found, find what I found here, which is just that feeling of, all right, somebody knows how I feel. All right. Um, you know, having said that, Ron did pull me aside and go, this is a no profanity meeting, Rory. No, no profanity. So I, uh, I, I generally don't believe in using profanity from the podium anyways. I, I try to be an example of Alcoholics Anonymous. But, um, oh, man, I love, I love, I love this fellowship. I, I love everything about it, man. I love, um, it's where I feel at home. You all are my people, you know. I, was, I love the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, you know, I was sitting in the chair a few minutes before the meeting started and, and um, you know, you go to a meditation meeting and they tell you to go to your happy place, right? And um, 
you know, some people think about a creek or a riverbed or whatever, and, and me, I think about a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous a couple of minutes before it gets started, and the humming and the talking, and, you know, 60 people talking, not a single person listening. I mean, that's just, y'all are, are my people. I gotta say, thank you to the, so the last, I spoke at this group about five years ago, and, and uh, the last time I spoke here, I, 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 uh, I, was, I was living out in Las Vegas, and, and some people got the message and wore their Vegas attire, and that's, you know, I was thinking about wearing a sequin skirt myself to Night, but my my four steps already complicated enough. I didn't need to I didn't need to throw my sponsor for that uh, through that ringer. Um, I, uh, I I have a uh, I have a sponsor Bob Darrell in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I have a home group, the Primary Purpose Group in Austin, Texas, and I sponsor a lot of guys. Um, and um, um, You know, I tell you what, man, if you, if, if you go around Alcoholics Anonymous enough and, you know, uh, and you hear enough inventory and you, and you listen to enough speakers, you get to find out that basically all of our, all of our talks are pretty much the same, man. They're not, they're not that much different. And I'll tell you where they all start. They all start with this idea that, that long before we ever took this drink of alcohol, we felt different than, we felt apart from. Right? And that's no different for me, man. I was, I, I remember being a kid in school and, um, excuse me being a kid in school and feeling like all the other kids had the manual to life and I didn't have it, right? Like they met in the parking lot 10 minutes before school started and they decided, okay, we're gonna be cool, we're gonna play sports, we're gonna do this, we're gonna hang out, but nobody tell Rory, okay? And, uh, and that's how I felt, man, I felt different than. And um, by the time I was 11 years old, the feeling of being in my own skin was so painful, I started sticking razor blades in my arm. And, um, I, when I was 14 years old, I found alcohol, and, and, uh, and um, I remember, y'all remember where you were the first time you had your first drink? Who, re who remembers where they were when they had their first drink? I, I have never met an alcoholic who hasn't, right? I could tell you what the room looked like, I could tell you what was on television, I could tell you who I was with, what, to what time it was, what the weather was like outside. Now I'm a big boy, I come up from Texas, I love barbecue brisket. But if you gave me a million dollars right now, I couldn't tell you the first time I had barbecue brisket. Because the first time I had a drink, I had... Anybody ever take a drink or a hit or whatever and go... That is the sound of horrific emotional pain being released. Like the pressure on the pressure valve on my brain has just been opened. And okay, okay. And, you know, I started drinking at... Uh, at 14 years old, and I had a pretty good handle on it for a little while. I, I uh, you know, I, I didn't need Alcoholics Anonymous until about 15 years old, so I did, I did all right out there for a hot minute. And um, you know, what happened? You know, I, when I, when I started high school, man, I was, I, I was a, I was a, I was a kid with a lot of potential, right? I was, uh, you know, I was on the football team and I was in the Boy Scouts and I was in the advanced classes. And two years later, after I started to drink, I w I'd been kicked out of a one parent's house and I was in a different school and I'd been suspended and I, you know, and I was, I was, uh, you know, the school, the school police officer was looking for me all the time. I, I grew up thinking that nobody cared about me. And I would later find out the Anne Arundel County juvenile court system cared a lot about me. They were very, very interested in where I was and what I was doing, and you know, uh, almost like my first Al-Anon, that you know, that court system there. And um, and uh, you know, uh, um, and the next couple years of my drinking can be described very simply that I used anybody and anyone who was unfortunate enough to know me and unfortunate enough to come into contact with me to try to alleviate how it felt in my own skin. I was a, I was a hobo sexual for a while, right? Where you fall in love for a place to live, you know. I was young and good looking back then. I'm fat and bald now, so I can't pull that one off so much. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I tell you, man, I, I, I was 17 and I met this girl, she was 31 and she had an apartment and she would let me go over there and drink while she was at work. And I mean, it was real love to me. I mean, that's the closest thing to real love I've ever felt, you know. And, uh, and um, you know, but, but, but around this time period, I start realizing there's something different about me, right? I, uh, you know, when, when, when all the kids in school would go out and party on Friday night, the other kids would do weird stuff like they'd show up for class on Monday. And uh, that just didn't make that way. I was not interested in that, in that particular situation. 
and um, and uh, you know I'd gotten uh, I'd gotten this girl pregnant when I was a teenager, and you know so, uh, some of you've heard me talk before or heard heard one of my tapes, and you know that getting someone pregnant is not a particularly uncommon occurrence in my story. That's you know there's a little pattern there. Um, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a sociopath, man, and I had a good father in my life, and I wanted to be a good father to this kid, right? And, um, and this girl's dad, she was gonna get me a, a job at, uh, he was gonna get me a job at his construction company, and, um, and I went to my father and I said, Dad, I promise if you let me move back in the house, I will quit getting loaded, I mean it. And you could have hooked me up to a lie detector test, and I would have passed that lie detector test because I honestly meant it with every fiber of my being that I wasn't gonna do it anymore. Now what I didn't know at the time is I might have well have promised that man that I was gonna sprout wings, fly around the house and come back and land because I didn't have the power to make that promise. It tells us in there, in there is a solution that we cannot recall with sufficient force the wreckage of a week, let alone a month ago to stop us from taking the first drink. I'm not a guy who can think through the drink. I'm not a guy who can play the tape through and remember what it was like. And if you are, God love you, man, but you and I don't suffer from the same thing. I'm the guy who will swear to God, to the girl, to the parents, to all my people that I am not absolutely no chance going to do this again. And about five hours later, well, by not going to do it again, I mean like not within the same hour, obviously, right? Like, and I'm drunk again. And I don't know how. I remember at, when after I made that promise to my father, I'd... Um, I stayed sober for six weeks, and um, I came to in a, in a motel bathroom in Hagerstown, Maryland. I, I grew up in Maryland, and um, and I tell you that entire six weeks, I felt like I was holding my breath. And um, you know, I uh, that that girl uh, uh, had a miscarriage and lost that child, and, and her parents told me, "If we ever see you around here we're, again, we're calling the police." Um, People saying that to me was also not a particularly uncommon thing. That was a that was a repeatable thing, um, and uh, they had every right to say that, man. Before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a pretty I, I had a pretty good understanding of that first piece of the first step, right? That once I start, I can't stop. I didn't, you know, I had plenty of plenty of experience with, you know, I'm going to have a couple of drinks, I'm going to do a little bit of this outside issue, but I'm definitely not going to screw up the whole weekend, the whole night, you know, have, get thrown out of this house again. I'm definitely, definitely not going to do that, and um, doing it every time, you know, I. I, I it's funny living, I live out west now, I live in Texas, and before that I lived in Nevada. It, it, you know, you, you get drunk here and go into a blackout, you might wake up three states away, right? Like, because all the states are small. Like, the amount of times I'd start drinking, you know, outside of Baltimore and end up in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or New York or Virginia, like, huge, like, you know, Texas, man, you drive for five hours and you go from one part of the center of Texas to the other part of the center of Texas. Like, it's, the stories just aren't as cool. You don't get to be like, I started drinking in Baltimore and woke up in, you know, New York. Um, um, one time, I told, I, it's funny, I, I hadn't remembered this story in years and I, I remembered it last night and told it. I, um, we're, uh, we're, we're, me and my buddy are at a party and we're, uh, we're, we're drinking and we're doing some outside issues, right? And, um, and, is he turning me down? I don't, I don't, I don't blame him. I, look, I got to live with this voice 24 hours a day. Y'all only have to deal with it for another 40 minutes or so. So, you know, um, and, um, so at this party and we're drinking, we're drinking and we're, and we're doing some substances and, and, um, and, and we go to pull out on Governor Ritchie Highway, if any of you all are familiar with, with Anne Arundel County, Maryland. And, uh, and I open, I open the, the, um, the door to throw up, and I, and, I, and I lean forward to throw up, and I fall face, so I throw up, but then I fall face forward in, onto the road in my own throw up, right? And, and it actually didn't bother me at all. It was nice and cool and kind of, you know, night hot summer day, that, that asphalt was cool. And... Uh, this is crazy. I'm t this is a true, true fact. Did you know that the average person only throws up from drinking once in their life? That's like, that's like, like once a weekend for me. Like that's that that's the good time because you get to boot and rally. You get to go harder. You know. I don't. Know, that doesn't make sense to me. This is another crazy thing I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. This blow your mind. I'll tell you what. Did you know that there are people who are born, live their entire lives 
and die without ever being arrested. <laughs> Bet y'all didn't know that. I didn't know that when I got here either. Um, and um, and so anyway, so I fall out of this van and I'm, I'm laying on the street and I got this nastiness on my face and my buddy's like, you know you can't just like stay, like sleep there, right? Like you can't sleep in the middle of a highway, right? So I, I, he kind of gets me back in the van and I kind of clean myself up and we go down to his house about 10, 20 minutes away. And I'm like, so what you got to drink here? And he's like, you were just laying on the highway 20 minutes ago. What's wrong with you? Right? So, so, so the, the once I start, I can't stop peace. I got that. I got that coming in the door. I got that coming in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've, I've given up for that. But I'll tell you what, and, and, and if that were the only problem I had, I don't know if I'd ever make it to Alcoholics Anonymous. But what happened is alcohol stopped working for me. See, in those first couple of years, and it happened really, really quickly, alcohol isn't, you know, alcohol isn't magic. It's a chemical substance. The more and more I use of it, the less and less effective it becomes, right? So the first couple of years, I'd take a drink and I'd go from, you know, this, this depressed kid who, who was angry and didn't feel like they fit in their own skin to, you know, give me, you know, I walk into the party and I hate all these people, these losers. Man, what am I doing here? But you give me a couple of drinks, and I'm like, you know what? These people, they're not so bad. And you give me a couple of more drinks, and I'm like, you know, I kind of like being here. I like these people. You give me like eight, nine, ten drinks. I'm like, I love you. I, you're my best friends. Like, I'm inviting you to stay at the house, have some food out of the fridge. It's probably not my house or my food I'm offering to you, but the sentiment is there, and that's what matters, I think. Um, and... Um, but, but at a certain point, that, 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 that knob had shifted inside of me and it stopped doing that for me. And I was just as suicidal and homicidal when I was completely loaded as when I was bone powder dry sober. That's the jumping off place it talks about in our book where I can't imagine life with or without alcohol. And, um, you know, I... Uh, um, So, you know, I, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm floating around to people's couches and people's houses till their parents find out I'm there and, you know, and, 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 you know, girls' apartments till they get sick of my crap and sleeping in the Ford Ranger occasionally. Uh, I went on a date with a girl one time and, uh, and then we we're talking and she told me she too had lived in a Ford Ranger and I was like, oh my God, Stark, this is love. Like, you know, it wasn't. Um, and, uh, and you know, like, you know, like all good gangsters go back, end up at mom's house. That's the end of the road. Everybody knows that. And, um, um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, June the 4th of 2010, that was my last day. Uh, that was my last day out there. And I, and I, um, you know, I got drunk, uh, but it wasn't the worst I'd ever been drunk, and um, um, and I got violent, and it wasn't the worst I'd ever been violent. Um, and the next morning, the morning of June the fifth, I'm I'm sitting at my mother's table, and I'm just having one of those mornings, one of those oh no, oh no, you know those mornings. All of us know those mornings. The mornings long since have stopped being fun, and I just can't believe I'm doing this anymore. And this woman, my mother's, you know four foot 11, she was probably five foot then, and uh, you know, 105 pounds soaking wet, and uh, I was her only, her only child, and she absolutely, she loved me to death, and had hired lawyers, and doctors, and psychiatrists, and psychologists, and you know, put me through multiple treatment centers, and um, you know, I, I had gone to this first treatment center, when I was 16 years old, and um, I did the most important thing you can do at your first treatment center, I got a treatment center girlfriend, and uh, we got out of there, and uh, Spoiler alert, neither of us stayed sober. I just, uh, I just took, you know, one of my sponsees just went through his first treatment center breakup, so we got to do that together. It was, it was a fun time for everyone. Um, and um, so anyway, so, so, she's, so, the, so my mother says to me, uh, you got three hours to get out of my house or I'm calling the police. I'm having you trespassed on my property. And, um, and I don't know what to do, man. I don't know what to do. And I start calling this guy who was like an addiction counselor kind of guy, right? And, and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. And he says, um, 
He says, well, listen, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been sober for 12 years, and there's a meeting in Brooklyn, Maryland, which is, which is South Baltimore, and why don't you come to this meeting? And I go to the meeting, and there's this young black guy in the meeting he had on a red checkered shirt. I can see him in my head like it was yesterday. And he says, today can be the worst day, right? It can all be uphill from here. And I look up in the wall in the second step where it tells me that there's this power here that can restore me to sanity. I started sticking razor blades in my arm at, 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 11, at 11 years old. I'd attempted suicide. I'd attempted suicide. I'd been through, you know, psychiatric, uh, adolescent psychiatric facilities. Um, you know, pulled guns on people, had guns pulled on me a long way away from the Boy Scout oath, man, that I, that I was taken um, when I got here. And... And looking up at the wall where it said that you guys had something that could restore me to sanity, it gave me, it gave me enough hope to keep going. And I'll tell you what I understand the second step to be now. When it, says, when it says that this power could, right? I don't think that means could as in, um, as in if I'm a good little boy and I say my prayers and stuff like that. I think that means it has the ability to, right? It possesses the power to. And you guys told me that you had a power here that, that could restore me to sanity. Um, and that was enough to keep going. And I tell you what, my first couple weeks of sobriety, man, I'm going to four or five meetings a day. I'm smoking four or five packs of cigarettes a day. It was a rough time to be me, buddy. I'll tell you what. And, um, and I show up at the Saturday night young people's meeting in Annapolis, Maryland. And there's this guy speaking and I just, I hated every word he said. So if you're feeling that way tonight, I love you, you know, talk to your, call your sponsor about it. I'm sure he'd be glad to hear from you. Um, and he called on his sponsor to share and his sponsor had shared that he had a motorcycle and a girlfriend and he was sober and I was like that is a good deal man if I could get that deal we'd be alright and um, I, I go up to him after the meeting and I you know um, I go up to him I'm like hey man I'm like looking for like a sponsor man like I, did, I felt like I was asking if I could be his girlfriend like it was it was arguably the most humiliating moment of my life I debated just shooting myself and you know being done with the AA process at that point and he says and he says yes and he says we're all going to the restaurant uh, Rips, Rips restaurant down on uh, uh, Route 3 and um, and the guy who was speaking at the meeting he comes up to me and he says like uh, he says like what are you doing man well, you tell me, tell me what's going on. And I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm just trying not to drink and go to meetings. I'm just trying not to drink and go to meetings. And he goes like, you're probably going to die, bro. And like, I was ready to fight him outside the meeting. You know, I was young and tough back then. You know, I got about two minutes of fighting left in my life now. But he goes like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And what he shows me is he takes me into this book and he takes me into the doctor's opinion. And the doctor's opinion, it tells me that I'm restless, irritable, and discontent until I can once again gain the sense of ease and comfort that comes from taking the first drink. Then he takes me to page 52. And on page 52, it gives me the symptoms of untreated alcoholism. It tells me that I'm prey to misery and depression, that I have trouble making a living, that I have a feeling of useful uselessness, that I'm full of fear. These are the things that happen when I'm sober. See, what these guys explain to me is that I knew walking in these doors that I had a that I had a problem drinking alcohol. But if my problems what happens when I when what happens when I drink vodka? What's the solution to that problem? Let's hypothetically say I have a problem drinking both. It's don't drink. Anybody have any anybody have any luck with that? You know, Nancy Reagan just say no here. Sorry, Nancy Reagan was a president's wife a long time ago. I don't you know I, we got some younger folks here. Um, and um, that would work for me. See, I had this, I had this buddy, uh, Dan Sink, Sinky Boy, and to look at each of us on the outside, right? We drank, we drank just like each other, we used just like each other, we committed crimes together, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you would have looked at us and said, both of these guys are alcoholic. But see, Dan had met this girl and they'd fallen in love and they were gonna, they were gonna move to New Jersey and have a family and have some children. And, and he said, Rory, I'm gonna stop, I'm just absolutely done. I don't know who moves to New Jersey to get sober, but he did and it worked. And he never went to meetings and he never did any steps and he stayed sober because he's a hard drinker. He's not a real alcoholic. Given, tells us in our book, given sufficient reason, ill health, falling in love, warning from a doctor, become operative. This, this man can stop or moderate, although he may find it troublesome, right? But what about the real alcoholic? Consequences can't keep me sober. And moreover, the minute I put, my, the, the minute I put that drink down, that's when the problem begins. 
See, we're all, you know, a few of us are going to go eat after the meeting, and, and, and if I ordered a big old bowl of strawberries and started popping strawberries in my mouth, and, and, and I had, a, and I had a, a, my throat swelled up and I couldn't breathe, and y'all ran me off to the hospital to get a shot of Benadryl, you'd think, wow, that guy has a pretty, pro pretty serious problem with strawberries. But if you flew down to Texas to come check on me on Monday and you saw me sitting at my desk eating some strawberries, you wouldn't think my problem was strawberries anymore. You'd think this guy's insane. See, this is what these guys explained to me is, is that they said, Rory, you've only got two problems with alcohol. What happens when you drink and what happens when you don't drink. Other than that, you're fine. Have a good day. Clancy and Mislid used to say that when I get sober, it's like someone breaks into my house in the middle of the night and installs a spring in my gut, and that spring starts tightening and tightening and tightening. And it's never, and, and, and it's never once manifested in, well, I believe I'm suffering from the spiritual malady right now, manifesting in restlessness, irritability, and discontentedness. It manifests in I start noticing all the stupid people in the world. And I start noticing how the guy at work next to me is getting $2 an hour more than I am, but I'm the one carrying this company. And I start noticing how she's not treating me like a man of my stature deserves. And I start noticing how the guy in the 10 item line has 11 items. And I know because I've counted them 15 times and there must be justice in the world. And my family doesn't understand how I got arrested going to buy milk. And then and then I, I've sponsored a lot of guys over the years who've relapsed, right? And every single one of them, I ask them, you know, I ask them what, you know, when they relapsed and, and what time of day it was. And, and you know, that they say I relapsed at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, whatever. And I say, well, what time did you wake up that morning? They say, oh, I woke up at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, whatever. And I say, now, had I run into you at Starbucks 30 minutes after you woke up and asked you, are you going to drink today? What would you have told me? To a man, every single one of them has said, absolutely not. But now if I open the book to page 52 and I read off those eight things in there, those eight symptoms of untreated alcoholism, misery, depression, trouble making a living, trouble in personal relationships, full of fear, what would you have said? Yes, 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 yes. In poker, in poker aces and eights is, eights is the dead man's hand, right? We have eight symptoms of untreated alcoholism. Eight for eight, that's the dead man's hand. And when I go back through the steps today, I look at page 52 and, and, and I look at, at how many of those things on page 52 apply to me because that's what tells me where I am in the, cycle, in the cycle of alcoholism. See, the cycle of alcoholism is that I drink until I can't possibly drink anymore. I'm suffering every consequence. Uh, everybody's mad at me. I'm breaking mom's heart. The girl can't stand to be around me, all that stuff. And, I'm not, and I make a firm resolution. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to hurt these people anymore. And I absolutely mean it, and I give it my absolute all. I give it every ounce of willpower that I've got. Man, and alcoholics, we've got some willpower. But over a period of time, it becomes so uncomfortable and so painful and so my head won't stop talking. Mark Houston used to say people don't shoot themselves in the foot. They shoot themselves in the head because that's where the voices are coming from. So after a period of time, it becomes so painful and it becomes so uncomfortable that I have to drink again. You might as well tell me not to breathe oxygen anymore. And then I take that drink and the cycle starts itself again. And that's what these guys explained to me in my first home group. They explained to me that if I'm the real alcoholic, if I'm the real McCoy, not two beers and oh dear, not the little disco drunk, not the hard drinker, if I'm the real alcoholic, that I will repeat this cycle again and again until I die. These guys gave me what, what uh, Charlie Parker used to call a fatal dose of the first step. Because see, unless I have a fatal dose of the first step, unless I believe that I suffer from this thing on a level that will kill me, then making amends is a nice idea, but not one I'm interested in, right? I don't know anyone who's ever walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and been like, all right, I want to stop drinking whiskey, so I'll make a list and admit things that my lawyer told me to never tell another human. I'll go pay back the most miserable people ever, and I'll spend all my life trying to help these miserable drugs. Yeah, that sounds great. Sign me up for AA, right? Unless this is my only solution. If I had 20 more dollars the day I got sober, June the 5th, 2010, wouldn't be my sobriety date. Unless I'm motivated by a fatal dose of the first step, then all of this stuff is pointless and academic. So, um, 
So I get with these guys, man, and they take me down to the restaurant and, and they, you know, they, they, I, I didn't have any money and they bought me a cheeseburger and they picked me up and they took me to meetings and they bummed me cigarettes and, and, um, and uh, they, they told me that we pulled the newcomer with a vision. And that's what they did, man. They, pu they pulled me with a vision. They went out um, to the beach. It was maybe, I, uh, you know, I'd maybe a month sober, maybe, maybe been hanging out with these guys for about a week. And they said all the, all the men in the home group were going to go out to the beach. And, and they said I was going to go with them. I said, I don't got no money for no kind of beach. Like, that's, that's not, you know, I don't have money for, you know, to gas, much less uh, staying at a beach. And they said, we didn't ask you if any money. You're going to come and you sleep on the couch and we're going to have meetings and we're going to hang out in the ocean and pull, throw the football and it's going to be a great time, man. And these guys, you know, they love me, man. And, um, you know, there's, there's nothing more I hate in Alcoholics Anonymous than, than, than you know, going into a meeting and, and you know, uh, I'm sure this never happens in, in Pennsylvania, but sometimes it happens in Texas. Going into a meeting and seeing some newcomer in the corner by himself where everybody else is laughing and joking around on the other side of the room. Pup. Attraction rather than promotion is our public relations policy. That's not how we that's not how we work with newcomers. In the book, it tells me very specifically and very exactly the lengths and extents I'm supposed to go to to work with the new man. And maybe I can find it. On page 97. My buddy Gary calls these the 12 step promises, man. On page 97, it says, never avoid these responsibilities. It says, it may mean a loss of many nights sleep, great interference to, with your pleasures and interruptions to your business. Okay, I'm gonna have pleasures in a business, that ain't too bad. It says it may mean sharing your money in your home. Okay, I'm gonna have money and a home. That ain't bad. It says it may mean counseling frantic wives, relatives, and new mobile trips to police courts, sanitariums, and asylums. Your telephone may jangle at all hours of the night. Your wife may complain she is neglected. I'm going to have a telephone and a wife. Okay, check, check that off. A drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn your mattress. I'm going to have furniture, a home, and a mattress. And I'll tell you what, man, there's been times in my life where I haven't had any of those things, so that ain't too bad. You may have to fight with him if he is violent. Sometimes you have to call a doctor and minister sedatives. It tells me really clearly the lengths that I'm supposed to go to to work, to work with a newcomer. And these guys understood that. And I'll tell you what, man, I've bought thousands and thousands of cheeseburgers trying to pay that back. And um, I'll never be even. If I stay sober another 50 years, I won't be even. Um, I told that story one time from a podium in Portland, Oregon, and a guy hollered out in the back, they could have bought you a salad once or twice. I was... <laughs> Deeply, deeply, not getting the respect a man like me deserves. Exactly. You guys understand. You guys understand. But I'll tell you what else they did. They said, well, we're going to work the steps really, really quickly because you're really, really going to die. And, I, and, and thank God I fell in with these guys, man, because had they said, you know, let's wait a year, let's work a step a month, let's do something like that, I wouldn't have made it, I wouldn't have survived. Because, because that spring in my gut was tightening up again. That thing, that voice in my head was starting to go again. And these guys said, we have a power that can relieve that. We have a set of, set of steps to get you in touch with that power. See, people got sober occasionally before Alcoholics Anonymous. In groups like the Washingtonians or the Oxford Movement, or sometimes at back tent church revivals, people would be struck sober. In fact, when Roland Hazard went to see Carl Young, um, and, 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 and asked, and, 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 and Young, who was the most celebrated, accomplished, qualified uh, psychiatric medical professional in the world, he said to him, there's nothing I can do for you. Are you completely hopeless? You're gonna die drunk or you're, or you're gonna be under lock and key for the rest of your life. And Roland Hazard says, what can I do? I, my, my family has plenty of money. There's no treatment too, too, too unaffordable for me. What can I do? And, 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 and the most accomplished psychologist in the world looks at him and goes, the only thing that works is on rare occasions, sometimes people like you have, reli have religious experiences known as phenomena. That is how rare it is. It was referred to as phenomena, that someone could get, that someone could have a, have, have a spiritual experience that would produce the, the, rearra the, the rearrangement of, emotion, of emotions, attitudes, and outlooks that would allow them to remain sober. What Alcoholics Anonymous did was it made the spiritual experience repeatable and predictable. It gave me a very specific set, set of actions to take to have this spiritual experience. And that's what these guys told me we were going to do. I remember the, I was maybe six weeks sober when I did my first fifth step. And it's, um, 
I go over to my sponsor's house after the Friday night meeting and it was thunderstorming and it hadn't started raining yet. And, um, and, and we go through all of this thing. And, it, and, and, and just like it does, we just read in the 12th step, every step in this book, it has a specific set of actions and it has promises that follow those actions. In the fifth step, it gives me specific promises. It says, if I have taken this step with holding nothing, unveiling every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past, then I can be alone in perfect peace. Then I can look the world in the eye. Then I will feel that I'm on the broad highway. And I did that, man. I did, at that time, the most honest and thorough fifth step that I could have done. A, a searching and fearless moral inventory. And I walked out of his house and it was thunderstorm and it hadn't started raining yet. And I had a spiritual experience for the first time in my memory. I had no desire to drink. Spiritual experience is a result of spiritual action. And only a result of spiritual action. As I understand it. See, the solution to alcoholism is not meetings. Meetings are the pep rally for the solution. I come to meetings to hear a speaker who might have a new way of working the steps or might give me some motivation to go make that amends I haven't made or go pick up some more sponsees. But I don't get the solution in the meeting. This is where I go to get excited about the solution. I know guys who've gone to thousands and thousands of meetings for years and years and years and can't stay sober. And the two questions are, did you ever finish a fourth step and did you make all the amends in the ninth step? A couple weeks later, man, I, 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 I'm making amends. I did my eighth step list. I'm going to make amends. And I'm sitting, my first amends was at this, uh, this hardware store that I'd worked for. And, um, you know, they paid me six bucks an hour or whatever minimum wage was at the time. And if you know me at all, you know I think I'm worth about 600 bucks an hour. Um, so someone had to even those scales, and I decided I was going to do it by having a little unlicensed hardware distributorship, you know. Um, I was stealing, for those of you, you know, a little, a little slow on the uptake on that one. Um, so I'm sitting in the park, I'm sitting in the parking lot of, um, I'm sitting in the parking lot of this, uh, of this hardware store, and I call my sponsor, I'm like, what did they call the police on me, man? I used to show up. To, I, I totally had forgotten about this. And my buddy Andy reminded me of it. I used to show up to meetings wearing like, uh, I'm, sure, I, I'm sure this is not what they're called anymore, but like those wife beater t-shirts, you know what I mean? Like thinking I was some kind of hard guy, you know? And I'm sitting in the, you know, I'm sitting in the, in the parking lot of this store like crying that they might call the police on me. And I think it's hilarious because like the day before I get sober, yeah, baby, I'm an outlaw, right? The, like, uh, uh, give me a couple months sober, and it's like, but I could go to jail, you know? And um, he had come from that school for hard-hearted sponsors, so he didn't really care about that. And he had said, well, do you want to drink vodka, or do you want to make the amends? And I said, I'll make the amends. So I go in there, and I ask for the owner of the store, and, um, oh, my God, I'm like, I worked for you from this day to this day. I stole these things. I think it cost this much money. Here you go. And the guy was so confused. He's like, do you want a receipt or like what? You know? and, um, and man, walking away from there was a wonderful experience. It was the best, best, best experience I've ever had. In my experience, you know, the, the, the more I have to trust God in the process of making the amends, the bigger the spiritual payoff is. Right? Like so when I was... Um, when I was four years sober, I, I went to make an amends. I, I, was, I was stealing data from this company that I worked for when I was in early sobriety. And, um, uh, and, um, and I'm four years sober, and I go to make an amends for this. And understand, that, like, this is a federal crime, right? And if you go to, go to enough middle-of-the-road AA, enough weak AA, you can get a lot of support for not making amends, right? You know, people will say crap like... Um, uh, well, it says we made these amends unless it would hurt them or others and you're part of others. Thank God the guys who sponsored me didn't get on board with that stuff because I'd be dead today. So I'm sitting in, in this parking lot of this company at four years sober and, I, and I'm absolutely terrified. I'm completely convinced that I am like, uh, you know, that I'm going to be spending the night in prison, right? And, and I'm thinking like, well, I couldn't really afford my rent anymore, so I guess that's okay, you know, I don't know. Um, and I walk in there and I asked to speak to the owner of the company and I, and I told them exactly, exactly what had happened. I told them I'd stolen this data. I told them I didn't know how much it was worth. Um, it, it was probably it was probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I'd sold it for like twenty five hundred bucks because I'm an idiot. Um, 
and um, I told him I have no idea what this is worth. I'll pay you whatever you tell me as long as long as it takes. I have five hundred dollars today, um, and if you want me to, I will. And if you want to press charges, I'll plead guilty to this federal crime. And that let me say this: that wasn't one of the amends where they were like, "Just stay sober, Rory. It's okay. We're glad you're in AA." That was not the case. By the way, that doesn't work with the IRS either, right? The, I, the IRS has yet to ever care that I'm about a spiritual manner of living. Um, and, um, and, and here's what they tell me. They say, we want you to put this all in writing so we can give it to our lawyer. Then we're going to decide what to do. And I did. I put it all in writing. I gave it to him. And, 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 and I go to leave there not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing if, if, if I'm going to end up going to prison for this or not. And I get in this little car that didn't have this little Nissan Altima that didn't have air conditioning. And I'm going up to the Carvel Club. And I got Sweet Home Alabama all the way up on the radio. And the windows are rolled down. And man, it's me and God in that front seat. I had a personal experience with God as a result of spiritual action, as a result of trusting God. The difference between trust and faith, if I go to the circus and I look up at the high wire and I see the acrobat wheeling the wheelbarrow across the high wire, I have faith that he's going to be able to do that. He's probably done it a lot of times. He probably does special exercises to be able to walk across that high wire. He probably is very practiced and in training for this his whole life. But if I trust it, I'll go up and sit in the wheelbarrow while he pushes it across the high wire. I can't get trust in God through theory. I can't get trust in God through sitting in meetings and reading spiritual literature. I read three pieces of spiritual literature every single morning, but all it does is encourage me to take the next action of trust in God. And, and I'll tell you what, that when, I'm, when I'm reading spiritual literature and I'm going to meetings and I'm not taking the actions of trust in God, it's even worse. And I'll, I'll share this with you. Uh, so the guy who owns that company, you know, we're, we're still in the same industry and um, you know, I, I would see him at industry events for years, and, and we'd chat a little bit. And he called me last week as I was on the way back from, uh, from West Texas, back to Austin. And, um, and we were chatting a little bit and talking about our businesses. And, and he ends the conversation. And he says, what would you think about being business partners? What would you think about us, us buying your business, giving you a little piece of our business, going into business together? That's the promise of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the promise of the amends. I went into this guy's office, I confessed to stealing from him from this business he worked very hard to build and today we're having conversations about going into business together. Spiritual experiences are a result of spiritual action. When I was, um, when I was about six years sober, I was, um, I was deeply, deeply involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, uh, I, was, I was chair of the Young People's Committee out in Las Vegas and I was bid chair for this and co-chair for that and GSR and ABC and LMNOP and all this stuff, right? And I, um, I can't figure out, but I've got another girl pregnant and another girlfriend and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm living credit card to credit card and I'm using one credit, I'm making good money, I'm director of this big company down in Austin, but I, but I, you know, my bank account's overdrawn every month and I can't figure out why my life has fallen apart. And, uh, and right around this time I meet, uh, I meet Charlie Parker, Charlie passed back on May 11th, who was a hero in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and I sit down with him and I say, Charlie, I don't know what's going on, man. I do, I, I give my life to AA and I don't know why this is happening. And we were, uh, we we're in a hotel room in Jacksonville, Florida. He was speaking at a conference. And, and, and his wife, Katie Parker, goes, how much of your day do you give to the process of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I say, oh, I'm Mr. AA. I give so much time. And she goes, really? How many questions are there in the 11th step? I, I guessed and said 12, because normally around here, 12 is the right answer to everything. It's not 12. If your sponsor asks you, I'll give you a freebie. It's 10 questions, right? So she goes, I guess you're not writing the 11th step that often. And I don't think I'd ever written the 11th step. The question's the 11th step. And she said, what are the five instructions it gives us in the 10th step? And I was like, uh, don't drink, help others, go to meetings. Those are all wrong, Rory. Thank you for playing, though. And did you make all the amends on the ninth step? Well, no. I was amazed before I was halfway through. Then the list went in the drawer. What are you talking about? And uh, so I guess if you didn't do that, then, then, then we don't really have much to work with in six and seven. And I go, I guess not. And she's like, it's really shocking that the, the five steps of our 12-step program that you're working are not working out super well for you, right? And we go into 60 to 63 and we go into how with good motives, even when our motives were good, 
we found ourselves in constant collision with somebody or something. And that was the reality of my life, that I was in constant collision with somebody or something. And then I go, and then we go into the next, um, then we go into the next page where it tells me I'm an example of self-will run riot, although I usually don't think so, right? You know, and, 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 and I swear to God, the first time Charlie Parker showed me selfishness and self-centered in the book, I was like, well, that doesn't apply to me. And then once you wake up to selfishness and self-centered, it's all you can see. And, and it's like, when does the selfishness end? I sponsor these, uh, these two guys who are, who are diametrically opposed to each other. And one's like the most arrogant guy in the world. I relate to him spiritually. I just, you know, um, I, he'll call me and he'll be like, yeah, man, I'm the best employee they got at this company. They're lucky to have me over there. And this girl should have been honored that I took her out last night and like, and, and all this stuff, right? And, um, and then there's another guy I sponsor, I talked to him today, and he's the total opposite. He's like, I'm such a loser, and I'm going to just screw up everything. And like, those guys will look at each other and be like, well, he is really selfish and self-centered, but not me. It's the exact same thing. It tells us in the book that whatever our protestations are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, and our self-pity. So some guys that manifests in anger and resentment and others it manifests in self-pity. It's not that I think too much of myself. It's not that I think too little of myself. It's that all that I think about is myself. And a life where me on me is like this. It's like that thing from Alien or whatever it was, right? It's, it's just all I can think about is me. I have never once woken up in the morning and been like, wow, I wonder how Ron's doing today is my first thought in my head. It is... <sighs> I hope, what's going on with the kids starving in Africa? I got to get on that. My first thought, it's always about me, my relationship, my kid, my business, my money. And the pain of self-obsession gets so great that people drink again. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, what we do is we set up a life around other-centered other, other -centered action. It tells me, it tells me, and there is, this, uh, sorry, it tells me in We Agnostics that deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It's yet obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a, a program of addition. It is not a self-help program. It's not a fix-your-life program. It's a, you've done enough to your life, please take your hands off of it. And we're going to subtract things. It says obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. We are going to subtract the things from you that are standing in the way of your conscious contact with God. Because people who have contact, conscious contact with God don't sit in their own piss drinking Jack Daniels. Now let me be clear about what I said. Not information about God. There's a lot of people coming in Alcoholics Anonymous tonight. Priests, ministers, rabbis who have far more information about God than I will ever have, but not a level of conscious contact with God to keep them sober. What this program promises me is that, it, that through these actions it can remove from me the things, the ego, the fear, the resentment that block me from that conscious feeling of God. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, running, I'm running a little short on time here, man. It's always when, um, you know, when, when we start, it's like, how am I going to fill an hour? Then by the end of it, it's like, it's like man, I wish, I wish I had half of it back. Um, so I want, to tell you, I want to tell you a little bit about, as a result of, of getting into this deeper, deeper level of work in Alcoholics Anonymous, after I'd met Charlie Parker, my life started to take off, man. I, um, and had you looked at the outside of my life in that period of time, you would have been like, man, Rory's headed for trouble. This is bad. See, I had to leave that company that was paying me more than I'd ever made before to go be a dad to this kid I didn't know I was going to have in Las Vegas. And I, and I didn't have any money, and all the money I had was going to a, a custody lawyer. So I got to move from this nice apartment in Austin into a, into a buddy of mine's guest bedroom and pay him rent so I have some place to live. But I was deep in Alcoholics Anonymous and not just working with others, which I, which I think is absolutely crucial. I was, deep in, um, I was deep in the daily disciplines of Alcoholics Anonymous and my life got really, really good. The last time I spoke here was about five years ago and I just started a business and that business took off, made millions and millions of dollars. It, it, it was listed on Inc. Magazine's uh, list of fastest growing businesses in America twice and uh, you know, got full custody of that child and got a, got a big house down in Texas. There's a line in, in, in chapter 5 that says, is he a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness from life if only he manages well? And I'll tell you what happened as a result of that money, property, and prestige. And I don't think money's a bad thing, and I don't think property's a bad thing. It's when it becomes my property and not God's property, my money and not God's money, that it becomes a problem. So I start slowly walking myself out of Alcoholics Anonymous over a period of three years. 
And I never once stood up and said, well, I'm not going to AA anymore. It became, it went from a meeting every night to a couple of meetings a week to one meeting a week to a meeting a month to a hope from a host of sponsees to a couple of sponsees to one sponsee to no sponsees. And I'll tell you what happened to me, man. With millions of dollars in the bank and 12 years of sobriety, I was sitting in a closet with a shotgun in my mouth crying. With everything on the outside that I ever thought would make me happy. Literally above my head was a, was a plaque from Inc. Magazine, fastest growing businesses in America, and a, shot, and a Mossberg shotgun in my mouth sitting on the floor. I didn't drink, but I, did, I hurt myself, and, I, and, and, um, and it was only by seconds and inches and a grace of a power I don't understand that I didn't drink. See, that's how I know I'm the real alcoholic and not the heart drinker. Because over a decade removed from the use of the substance, with everything on the outside of my life looking correct, I was about to take my own life. And that's a level of first step experience that I don't wish on any of you, but I know some of you have had it, and I love you. That's, that's on the level of like driving to the dope man's house with tears in your eyes. You give me absolutely everything that I ever thought would make me happy and it does absolutely nothing to stop this disease of alcoholism. And I'll tell you where it started. It started with my primary purpose no longer being the next suffering alcoholic. And today I'm very happy to say my primary purpose in life is the next suffering alcoholic. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be asked to to, to talk from some podiums from time to time in Alcoholics Anonymous, but this is this is this this feeds something in me that should be starved: the desire for attention, the desire for look at me, the desire for you know, don't you know who I am? Right, that ego that blocks me off from from the sunlight of the spirit. My Alcoholics Anonymous program is you come down to Austin, Texas, and you go over to the Westlake Club more nights a week than not. You're going to find me there the, uh, waiting for the 1030 meeting. I get there about half hour, 40 minutes early, and I look for the guy who needs a cheeseburger or who needs a cigarette. And if I run him over to McDonald's, maybe he'll let me talk to him about the big book a little bit, and I'll share my experience with him. It is the single most important thing in my life. It comes above my business, my family, my children. And it does because I can't have any of those things without that being the single most important thing in my life. See, I set up a life that is deliberately inconvenient. When I, you know, most mornings when I, when I, when I roll, most mornings when I roll out of bed, um, the first thought sounds something like, she didn't bring me my coffee today. And if I'm having a good spiritual hair day, the next thought is, whoa, 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 self-will. We got to get to 10 and 11. We got to get to, we got to get to prayer and meditation, 86 to 88. Ask God to remove this, remove my thinking, direct my thinking, remove selfish and self-seeking motives. And then by the time I look at my phone, I've already got a couple of sponsee phone calls to return. And by the time I'm at my office, I've talked to two or three sponsees. And, and, and without, inconveniently and without my belief Without, without my consent, my thinking has been shifted from myself to others. And that's what allows me to feel the conscious presence of God, to feel the peace in my own skin. I'll, 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 something I want to add, man. I, um, there's a line in the book that says we, 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 take to, we, we seek the solution with all the desperation of a drowning man, right? And the thing about a drowning man is they don't ask a lot of questions. If you pull up on a drowning man in a boat, they don't say... Well, I'm not a big fan of blue boats. Do you have any other colored boats? They get in the boat. And the experience that I've had in untreated alcoholism now drives me into that level of desperation on a daily basis. You know, sometimes, you know, I, um, so after, uh, after Charlie Parker died in, Bay, in, in May, I, I, I picked up Bob Darrell as a sponsor, and it's been an incredible thing in my life. And uh, I don't know anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous who helps more people and does more service. And, and that pulls me to do more and more on a daily basis. Um, and the level of respect I have for my, you know, my sponsor is the final authority on my life in my Alcoholics Anonymous program. That's what I believe. Um, and if that offends you, call your sponsor. And, um, and if your sponsor disagrees with me, he's right and I'm wrong. Because I hope you have the level of respect for your sponsor that I have for mine. I called my sponsor the other day and... Um, you know, my, my business is struggling. I owe the, I, I owed the IRS $200,000. Uh, and um, and I'm, I'm calling him because I'm mad that the IRS will only give me a two-year payment plan, right? They won't give me more time than that. And he goes, well, could you afford to pay it all right now? I'm like, well, yeah, but I got to take like some money out of my retirement and stuff. He goes, perfect, pay it all right now. In four minutes, the man cost me $200,000. Like, I don't, I don't, you hear these old timers talk about, 
I used to have to pay a quarter to call my sponsor at the payphone. Like, calling my sponsors cost me $237,000. Like, but I'll tell you what taking that level of direction has done. I have more freedom and more peace and more happiness in my life than I ever had. My financial situation's fine. My home is fine. I have peace in my relationship. Even when we fight, I have peace in my relationship. And I have absolute and complete belief in that third step contract. See, what the third step contract does is it tells me that my money and, 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 and my family and my relationship are no longer any of my business. I have, ex I have only two objectives in life. Objective number one is to stay close to God. And the second is to perform his work well, to seek and do his will. His work is helping his kids. I've been sober since June the 5th of 2010. And for that, I owe you my life and I pledge you my life. Thank you. Okay, good evening everybody again. My name's Brian, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Roy for coming out here tonight and delivering an incredible message of hope and recovery to our group here. Uh, a couple quick announcements and we'll wrap up the meeting here. Again, the food and the fellowship for this group says starts at eight o'clock, so feel free to show up early and join us, enjoy the refreshments, the coffee that we put out. Uh, if you want to get involved in service with this group, you know, we have service positions available. We'd appreciate it. Uh, there's always a meeting after the meeting, so if you're out there, you're new, like I said, hang out with us, uh, stay, talk to some people. If you want to help us out with some service work after the meeting, we can always use some help putting away the chairs. Uh, this group has commitments in hospitals and institutions, too, so if, you have, if you're interested in doing that kind of thing, bring in a message of hope and recovery to the sick and suffering. See me, we got uh, plenty of stuff going on. Um, it's customary for us to thank our speakers as they come here on their own time and expense. Usually, we'll form a line in the front here, and we'll thank our speakers. Uh, Thank you to our greeters, our readers. Thanks to Miss Kay for taking care of the kitchen tonight. And uh, let's give our speaker, Rory, one more round of applause. And uh, if you do care to join us, we have a nice way of closing. We'll close down the meeting with a brief moment of silence for the still sick and suffering alcoholic inside and outside of these rooms, followed by our Lord's Prayer. Our Father.